and Israel shall dwell safely, and this is his name whereby he shall be called. The Lord our right, Lord our righteousness. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that they shall no more say, The Lord liveth, which brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But the Lord liveth, which brought up and which led the sea, sea of the house of Israel out of the north country, and from all countries, whither I have driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. Here in the blessing. Thank you, God.
Lord our God, whose glory is in all the world. We command this nation and our merciful care, that being guided by thy providence, we may dwell secure in thy peace. Grant to the President of the United States and of all in authority wisdom and strength to know and to do thy will. Fill them with the love of truth and righteousness, and make them ever mindful of their calling to serve this people in thy people. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in all things, one God, world of heaven. Amen. O Lord, God of hosts, stretch forth, we pray, thy almighty arm to strengthen and protect the armed forces of our country. Support them in the day of battle and in the time of peace. Keep them safe from all evil. It do them with courage and loyalty, and grant them in all things they may serve without reproach. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, thy unworthy servants, do give thee most humble and hearty thanks for all thy goodness and loving kindness to us and to all men. We bless thee for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life. But above all, for thy inestimable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ. For the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we beseech thee, give us that due sense of all thy mercies, that our hearts may be unfaithfully thankful, and that we shall This fake God of our imagination 
would live trapped inside a land or trapped inside a false idea of heaven so many people have. He comes whenever we call him and he grants us wishes that improve our position in the world. This deal sounds great. This is the deal many preachers give to their congregations. Worship here and the genie God will bless you. The tale of the problem with imagining the Almighty God as our genie is that the true God does not actually answer to us at all. Period. Full stop. When we pray to God, we are not con contacting our employee or God to be our magical slave. No, who are we praying to? We are praying to the, the Lord our righteousness. We are praying to our King. We are to be the ones on our knees before the sovereign majesty of the God who knit us together in our mother's wombs. The God who knows everything about us. The God who cares enough about us to tell us no. Genies never say no, right? You make a wish and act. Because genies are a creation of our fallen minds. Minds that wholeheartedly believe that one more fulfilled wish will make us happy. Just that one thing, that's the thing that we can do. It's easy. The cosmic insurance agent is another false god to whom we turn to on a regular, semi-regular basis. Um, I recently had to buy insurance. Uh, and it's amazing to me how much the insurance man's pitch was like the same pitch I get in my mail to go to certain churches. They're functionally the same idea, right? I mean, we have this fantasy that if we dutifully pay our religious premiums and take care that we have enough holy coverage, that will get us through the unforeseen problems of this life and the next. Again, no one would vocally compare their relationship with God and their relationship with their insurance man. But it is our actions which reveal the reality of our relationships. For example, if we treat our faith like an insurance policy that occasionally needs to be renewed by our going to the office and signing some papers, if we pray to the living God for the same reason we call our insurance provider with the same level of urgency and intensity, if we think we have a solid handle on life, and our religion is only for emergencies. If we pack our Bibles away in some drawer, just like our important insurance documents. If we imagine our faith as something we own, rather than something which owns us. We may be lying when we say, And here we offer and present unto thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls and bodies to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice. Our God is not a genie or a cosmic insurance salesman, as Jeremiah the prophet St. John so clearly state today. And frankly, thank God for that. For none of us need a genie or a cosmic insurance agent. We're much more <laughs> desperate straight than that, right? We need the true prophet, priest, and king, and the ultimate satisfaction he graciously supplies to an undeserved world. We need the reality. We don't need the fantasy that comforts. We need that reality. How God has revealed himself to us, both in Scripture and in the Word of God. St. John and the Apostle were walking with that revelation of who God is every day of his ministry. And in John 6, we, we read this. I love how John gives us a lot of details. Right? He's, he's writing a history. He wants us to know so it would be like what it was like to be on this journey. He writes, After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And the large crowd was following him, because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, is at hand. St. John 6, 1-4. Today's Gospel reading begins right after this little introduction, um, but this introduction is really quite necessary for understanding what this great and miraculous feeding occurs within the ministry of Jesus. 
John sort of sets up the entire ministry of Jesus around the three Passovers. We should not miss that these events occurred during the second Passover of Jesus' three-year campaign against the forces of darkness. In John's Gospel, the first Passover features Jesus whipping money changers and animals out of the temple, a prophetic sign act that this old worship was done. This temple itself would be destroyed. The last Passover would, of course, be in the upper room and the cross, where Jesus himself would serve as the new and spotless lamb, the original Passover pointed toward. So this second Passover is really important, and that's where our attention is drawn this morning, as Jesus is miraculously feeding his people in the wilderness. In each of these Passover events, we see Jesus fulfilling his role as prophet, priest, and king. This ever important title that represents the fulfillment of all the divine promises of the Old Testament through the incarnation and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. For instance, we see that only a king can destroy the temple. As Nebuchadnezzar did in 586 BC and at the Emperor of Aspasian to do in AD 70, only a prophet can feed people in the wilderness, as we see Moses did, and only a priest can sanctify a lamb as a Passover offering for an unclean people. Jesus does all three of these roles because he is the embodiment of what all these three were pointing to. He is all three because we need all three in a perfect man. We should drive us to thinking more deeply about why we have this Old Testament prophecy sort of hooked on to it. You may have noticed that the epistle today is an epistle, but it's a lesson from Jeremiah's prophecy, an Old Testament lesson, in fact. So speaking of that Old Testament prophecy in Messiah Kings, Jeremiah is giving us a piece of this puzzle hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus appears. What do we read? He says, Behold, the days are coming, when I shall raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and be wiser, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell secure. And this is the name by which he will be called, the Lord our Righteousness. Jeremiah 23, 5 through 6. This prophecy is made at a fascinating time in the history of Israel and Judah. This is just a few years before the fall of Jerusalem when Nebuchadnezzar would come and destroy the temple and seemingly destroy the line of David. And it looks forward to a mighty king who will bring justice and righteousness in the land. Remember, there's already a king of Judah at this point. Can you imagine how much he liked that he was going around, that Jeremiah is going around saying that this king is not the one? I mean, this very name, you see, why is it the Lord our righteousness? What does that even mean? Well, it's twofold. It has a present meaning when he says it in the 7th century. It's a name that serves as a stinging repudiation of the actual king at that point, um, King Zedekiah whose name Zedekiah means righteousness is the Lord, right? You can see how Jeremiah is poking the bear. He's saying that's not the great king to come. That's not the Lord of righteousness. The king being prophesied by Jeremiah is the perfect opposite. See, the, the phrase is flipped around. He's the perfect opposite of Zedekiah. And all the fallen and evil kings who came before and we follow after him. This king, this new king, will not fall into the corruption and evil that besets every earthly ruler. No. He is and will be the perfect king for a perfect world. <clears throat> this future reality makes it clear why Jeremiah speaks of the salvation of Judah, which barely existed at this point, and the securing of Israel, the northern kingdom, which had already been scattered at the full winds by the Assyrians. 
It would be easy for us to falsely imagine that he's talking about the reclamation of some kind of temporary earthly kingdom. But the fulfillment of this promise of salvation and renewal seen in the resurrection of Jesus, this prophesied king, is so much greater than the establishment of one more sort of shadowy nation state. That doesn't say anything. To really save Judah, to really secure the northern kingdom, to bring them all, and frankly, to really save you and me and everyone we care enough to share the gospel, that salvation requires a different kind of king. And Jesus is that different kind of king. Over and over again, he shows us this. He is a king who actually provides the righteousness we need to live and gives us this new life so we can be the people he calls us to be. The miracle we read about today, by which Jesus feeds thousands and thousands of people, seems like an amazing and unbelievable event that challenges our very idea of how the natural world works. But in comparison to creating and saving a holy people from themselves, a miraculous meal seems significantly less impressive. However, it is in this meal that we see just how much Jesus confounds our own expectations of what it means to be a king, and how this unexpected but true king now challenges our actions and our lives even now. So how does St. John present the aftermath of the miracle? Right? That's the thing that we're focused on today. He writes, when the people saw the sign he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus, perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force and make him king, he withdrew again in the mountain by himself. St. John 6, 14 through 15. The people watching the miracle understand what has happened. They recognize that they are in the presence of the prophet and king for which they have been waiting, for which an entire people have been waiting. And they try to force Jesus to become the king that they want him to be. They try to cage the Lord our righteousness. The utter insanity of trying to exert one's will upon the man who just made miraculous bread appear in a way not seen since God fed his people in the wilderness, this should not be lost to us, that this is kind of nuts. Jesus isn't going to let them take him unless he wants them to take him. Just as Jesus says to Pontius Pilate, you have no power except the power my Father gives you. But humans are quite capable of seeing the miracles of God, right? and yet still finding the self-delusional power necessary to believe that we are in command, that we are the ones who can bend God in our will. We're the powerful ones, not Whether we believe this fiction because we think we're the chosen people, or we claim this fiction because we falsely believe God owes us, this fiction is still there all the time. He is the one who comes. Finally, what we focus on in these miracles, and in our lives, really, determines whether or not we understand just what Jesus was doing when he whipped money changers out of the temple, or created bread from nothing, or gave of himself at the Last Supper on the cross. When we miss that Jesus is enacting through these three Passovers, we miss our own calling to humbly imitate the one true prophet, priest, and king. We can never ever replace the Son of God who reigns in the heavenly throne and will soon return to judge the living and the dead. We can't replace him, no one can. And when he tries to, he's an antichrist. But we do have an obligation to see what it means to be truly human by looking at the only good human man who ever lived. We 
have something amazing and wonderful as a gift from that good man. By the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit, all Christians can be prophets who call people from death in sin to life in Christ. All Christians can embrace the priesthood of all believers and offer their lives and fortunes as a living sacrifice to Christ. All Christians can become kings in this world by exhibiting the humble servant leadership of the king who washed his disciples' feet and suffered for those who loved him. It is in this way that we embrace in body and soul the kingdoms these three Passovers point us towards. It is in this way that we joyfully prepare ourselves for the kingdom that will have no end. May we, in this Advent especially, prepare for that kingdom that is coming, and may we prepare for that kingdom every day in In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost.
to the end that all that believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Here also at St. Paul said, This is a true saying and worthy of all men to be received, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Here also at St. John said, If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. The of God. We live up to the Lord. Let us give thanks unto our Lord
drink his blood of these holy mysteries, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his love, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. <laughs>
and the problem is it's for the free long. And so Q, like the full on it, so just get a shorter run so you can kind of pan it up and some things like Jim Swap and then give her a sort of cut he's he's getting good with his hands. He's very strong. And he's a lot stronger. Thank you.